Good evening, everybody. So this is Dr. Vishal from JP Hospital, New Delhi, and uh, we are going to talk about some troubleshooting in the acute phase of single ventricle palliation today in the post-operative period. Now, we know that single ventricle physiology by itself is a huge challenge, and you have the following palliative characteristics procedures that are done at different stages. For example, a PA band to control the pulmonary blood flow so that the patient can undergo a bidirectional current later. BT shunt, where you have a decreased PBF initially, you do a BT shunt to improve the pulmonary blood flow. And the final stage ultimately comes down to be a BDG followed by Fontan completion. So we start with the BT shunts, which are a challenge anyways for quite a few setups. Now, when we do a BT shunt, what are the problems that we face? So we start with the case out here, a two month, three kilos infant with a 3.5 millimeter BT shunt for a VSD pulmonary atresia and a closing PDA. In the immediate post-operative period, the child was saturating 80 to 85 percent. Very basic ventilator settings, airway pressure of around 13, 14, doing pretty well for itself. On five micrograms per kg per minute of dobutamine and a touch of norepinephrine, managed as per the standard protocol. Now, what is the standard protocol of BT shunt? That initially, you do have to keep the volume optimized, keep the pressure head on the higher side. Once you ensure there's no drainage, you start some heparin at 10 units per kg per hour. Tight. Don't give too much of inotropy. Manage with a balance of inotropy and pressures, but keep the pressures a bit on the higher side. For example, that three kilo child would require a pressure of at least around 80 or 90 in the initial phases to make the shunt main patent all throughout. And once you are totally 80 or 90 systolics. So once you are at a good pressure and the pressure of things are maintaining itself, obviously you, at that point of time, you start some heparin. Once you are sure after two hours, there's no drainage at 10 units per kg. We don't give too much of uh, FFP or cryos to these patients for bleeding. You try to manage by keeping the hematocrit around 35 to 40, but not more than 40. And obviously you do an echo, which shows that how your shunt is obviously functioning. That's the reason you're saturating and already right? That's it. Now, four hours later, this is the situation. The patient gets awake, and so four hours later, the patient got awake. He desaturated to 60%, had a major hypertension, pressure coming down to 60, and ABG had a hypoxia and a mix of metabolic and respiratory acidosis. So now I would like to know from you, if what do you suspect? What's going on out here? Good evening, Kamran. What is going on out here? Can anyone tell me? Okay, maybe a shunt block acutely, possible. Yes, second. Any other possibility that comes to your head? Okay, fine. Now you can have a shunt block, vasodilated, um, very unlikely because they normally are giving some pressures and not pain all this vasodilated. Pneumothorax, yes, can be a possibility. Yes, it can be a possibility for that matter in any case who desaturate, so you'd always have to auscultate them. That is agreeable clinically. Something else which comes to your head? We'd always remember that, that this is a situation, the patient has got awake and the patient, the patient was doing pretty well for itself. The patient moves, desaturates and hypertension. I'm very sure that at least a few of you would have seen the situations on the bit side in the immediate post-operative phase of BT shed. So what you need to understand is there's some process by which you call there's an autoregulation happening even in the lungs. Your patient was a case of decreased PBF and over and above that, we just added a shunt flow. Now, when the child was calm and in the initial stages, the shunt was flowing and suddenly the moment he gets awake, the PVR goes unusually high and there's a little bit of a reactive component also there out here. So you know what, while you do everything for this desaturation hypertension, it's also important to address this aspect of this awake patient. You can sedate him, but sometimes the sedation will drop your pressures drastically. Once in a while, you may even have to paralyze them. So remember that while you are investigating all these causes of vasodilatation, pneumothorax, shunt block, there's a very strong possibility that it is a pH secondary exacerbated by the autoregulation phenomenon happening in the lungs because the lung vessels are not accustomed to the blood flow. They have just started receiving blood and this autoregulation manifests in the two or three hours after surgery. And then you find that suddenly the patient has got into a reactive vasoconstriction. With the patient gets awake, that is almost like a pH crisis. Now, this has to be managed. You can't hyperventilate and get this patient better. Believe me on that. This has to be managed totally differently. You have to keep the patient quiet. 
you can manage the solution if required paralysis a give a little bit of a volume maybe a 10 ml per kg bolus over half an hour sometimes it's required go up on your supports or pressers to keep the pressure head going and subsequently you get to the next point i'm sorry I'll just go to this. I think it has some problem with the slideshow in my system. I'll go to the regular thing. I hope you are able to see something in that here. It's a bit small, but I'm uh, in the slideshow. It was faltering even earlier. So, as I was talking, you have to give them fluids, 10 ml per kg. That has to be given over half an hour, and maybe repeat another bolus over half an hour. You have to keep them fluid totally optimized in this space after sedating them, because if you don't give adequate fluids, the pressures will come down further. Give some heparin. You're giving it 10 units already. You can go to 20 units. Some people also use a heparin bolus. I would suggest go to 20 units and wait and target your ICTs around 200. Improve systolic pressure head. Keep it towards the 50th to 75th percentile for that age and weight. Remember that there could be a pleural collection because you do shunts towards thoracotomy. So there could be blood in the pleural cavity which could have exacerbated that. So an X ray, as uh, one of your colleagues uh, just mentioned, that you have to rule out a pneumothorax. So an X ray would not be a bad idea. And that will also rule out a pleural collection. You'll do an echo 100% to see the shunt patency. If there's any metabolic acidosis in the AVG, please correct that. And in this duration, you may have to go up on the FIO2s a little bit. But remember, you're going on the FIO2s transiently, not permanently, to tide over the acute phase. So this is how the acute phase can be managed. And in 80% situations, if you do these things right, you will avoid the patient being shifted to the OT for a re-exploration for a shunt blockage. Because if suppose we don't react appropriately at this point of time, shunt blockage can happen because there can be a, a issue of a thrombus at the site of insertion of the shunt in the pulmonary artery, which can happen because of the sluggishness of the blood flow because of the high PVR related so vasoconstriction and autoregulation related vasoconstriction. So this is important that you tie this phase out very drastically. These one, one and a half hours can actually prevent the re-exploration and prevent a lot of, uh, if I may say so, additional stress to the child. Now, fortunately for you, 24 hours later, you were able to get the patient extubated on oxygen, 12 liters and saturating 95%. Now, if I say patient extubated on oxygen, 12 liters or 3.5 millimeter BT shunt in a three kg child, how many of you agree or disagree with me? Do you think that it is was wise to give oxygen of 12 liters to a patient after shunt extubation? Yes. But, uh, Kamran says no. I agree with him. Any other opinions coming up? So shunt overflow chances. So I think all of you are probably agreeing on that and I totally could uh, uh, admit to it that you should not be giving this oxygen. This whole idea of going for liters oxygen to a shunt is humbug. You should never target a saturation more than 90. A saturation of 85% is good enough. 80 to 85 is good enough. Then target your fire tools on ventilator as well as your saturations post extubation based on this and your titration of oxygen should be dependent on that. But in the layman's physiology, they may perceive it as an improvement and the X-ray shows increased vascularity. They don't react to it, but you find a gradual clinical deterioration happening, worsening respiratory distress, decline in neural output, and finally the patient gets intubated with a high PCO2, low PO2, and with the acidosis coming in and increasing lactates, primarily because of the shunt overflow leading to a LV dysfunction, which is added on because the LV is not accustomed to blood flow in such situations. Any other causes of uh, reintubation that come to your head besides shunt overflow? Always remember a diaphragm paralysis of palsy is a reality. Myocardial dysfunction in very few cases, especially if they are very sick and they're very severe LV dysfunction can add on to your misery, but that is will be a very sick shunt or a pre-op patient who's taken for surgery. Sometimes it may pre truant. Okay, but you have to remember about all the other things. So the complete checklist would include, obviously ruling out a shunt overflow, extremely important. Look at the diaphragm palsy and also look at the echo function before. Uh, so as a policy below, in our unit, whenever the child is below five kgs, we check the diaphragms. 
before we extubate them, especially a neonate or an infant, below five kilos, always the diaphragms are checked. Secondly, an echo before extubation is not a bad idea. You will see the shunt, you'll see the function, so you'll be more sure. So when we say the checklist phenomena, which is so important in today's day and age to make sure that you avoid morbidity, the checklist of a extubation in such a patient would include a proper heart function, no acidosis, normal or uh, normalizing lactate, good gas exchange appropriate for the disease and appropriate for the surgery, and reasonably good urine output. You know that we don't give too much LASIX to the shunt patients. So you should balance out the diuretics that you're giving. Don't overdo that because it can lead to a shunt blockage otherwise. Okay, so don't give too much of diuresis in such situations. Maybe a touch of a LASIX just as an infusion, just three or four hours before extubation may be good enough. Look at the patient clinically. If it looks third spaced, you can go up on that. But if it doesn't look third spaced, then in that case, obviously, make sure that you don't overdo the LASIX. Be very, very controlled about it. Okay. Now, if there is a shunt overflow, which is the primary cause of in the situation like this, it's always advisable that once you go back on a ventilator, ventilate with a slightly higher peep. I don't think so. I need to explain that to all of you. You know it. Why? Because you need to reduce the lung this uh, capillary distension. Come down in FI2 is drastically closer to room air and accept saturation in late 70s or early 80s. This is a situation where you will require diuretics as a site like use use of pulmonary edema. In LASIX infusion. In fact, very horrible cases also require peritoneal dialysis if they go very bad, especially when concomitantly they are associated with sepsis. And you will require a reasonably amount of good afterload reduction, either in the form of dobutamine or meldronone. When you extubate this patient, preferably to extubate on a non invasive ventilation, nasal CPAP, and or preferably on room air and keep the patient with a negative fluid balance. Now, this is talking of the shunt overflow and titrate oral afterload reduction in very specific case scenarios for temporary duration. Like once you're coming off dobutamine, a few cases may require a touch of NWAS and all that stuff, but don't overdo that again. This is something which where you have a situation where you really, the patient was stuck on a ventilator for a long time and you need some sort of an oral afterload reduction, low dose NWAS can be used temporarily, but not as a protocol, definitely not. So this has to be totally individualized. So that was regarding the shunt. If there are any questions, I think we'd all take it together later. Now I'll proceed to the PA band. Okay, now the PA band is another one of those dicey situations that you face, where considering it's a very short duration of surgery, the repercussions are sometimes really, really huge. It is primarily done in single ventricle physiology to control the pulmonary blood flow and ensure the patient gets prepared for a BDG later. If there's a restrictive atrial communication, you also do a atrial septectomy along with that. And the surgical decision on adequacy of PA band is based on the Trussler's law or rule. And I hope you are aware about that, all of you. What is the Trussler's law? What do we exactly mean by a Trussler's law for a PA band? To assess the size of the band, yeah, I agree. But how do you calculate it? So basically, uh, it is like this, a 20 plus one millimeter per kg. For example, 20 millimeter plus one mm per kg for the patient's weight. So that is the size of the band that will be adequate for the patient's pulmonary arteries, but not as modified in the certain way that once you put this basic band, after that, you should see the difference in the pulmonary and or the QPQS, where you see the pulmonary pressures and the systemic pressures. Now, if you're doing a PA band for a biventricular, like multiple VST repair later, in that situation, you have to keep a QPQS less than or equal to 0.5. But if you're doing it for a univentricular physiology, where you have to do a BDG later, see the biventricular, ultimately you do a biventricular repair. But in a univentricular, where you do BDG later, your PA pressure should come down further. Here, the QPQS has to be targeted as less than 0.3. So hence, to summarize, you have to have a narrower band for the univentricular physiology, higher. So the pressure between the systemic and pulmonary, there should be, the systemic pressure should be at least two thirds more than the pulmonary pressure in these situations. And the, law, uh, the ratio should be less than 0.3. So this is something which is to be done by the surgeon and they take the pressures in the pulmonary artery and the systemic vessel and accordingly, they tighten or loosen the PA band. So univentriculars require a slightly narrower band. Now, what happens is that why PA band is considered to be an emesis? 
Now, a lot of areas, including uh, to a certain extent, Rava Hospital also, we are practicing a lot of early extubation and PA band. Do you do an echo? Patient looks good in the operation theater. You feel that it can be extubated. You extubate and get it down. 80% situation it works, but those are not the 80% situations that we're talking about. We're talking about a 20% situation where it does not work. Where it can, you can suddenly have ventricular dysfunction coming in in the post-operative one and a half to two hours with acute dilatation of the underlying ventricle. That can be a reactive pH due to the hypoxia because the patient was having increased PBF earlier on. And once you have sort of induced the PA uh, constriction, the pH can still be there as a reactive phenomenon, though it probably there as a, uh, a vascular phenomenon, it may be there as a reactive uh, because of the hypoxia that may come in. And you can have a LVOTO with a restrictive bulboventricular foramen in a DIV physiology, especially when you're having a very small aorta coming from the smaller chamber, like it is a transposition with a DILV, and you have a bulboventricular foramen which is so that LVOTO may actually be exacerbated further. Okay, so these are problems that can happen and can create systemic circulation disasters, and one needs to be prepared for it. So when a PA band comes extubated, it's more dangerous than when the PA band comes on the ventilator. So your thresholds of going on a CPAP and everything have to be very well programmed. You have to keep everything ready. You can't wait for a crisis to happen and then react because sometimes it will be too late. So if you feel that you're not satisfied with the breathing of a patient coming back on an extubated, you take a blood gas, give him nasal CPAP, improves great, doesn't improve, go back to the ventilator because these patients can have very acute deterioration and very rapid deterioration. So they have to be taken very seriously. So as I just mentioned, it has to be practiced with a caveat that you are ready with everything and you're doing it with fully well that if suppose that the patient doesn't do well, you may go back on a ventilator very soon. How do you know that the patient is going back? Declining urine output, decreased mixed venous oxygen saturation, increasing the paucity of good systemic blood flow and worsening lactate, suggestive of myocardial dysfunction added on. So you will require a balance of inotropy afterload reduction with the nasal CPAP also, but you may also require ventilation and keep a very low threshold for that. Don't extend the patient if you feel that things are not improving beyond one or two hours, because if it is a single ventricle physiology, as I say single ventricle and myocardial dysfunction sits in, they don't give you too much time. So this is something which you should remember always that, okay, patient has come extubated, you feel it looks good, okay, wonderful. Doesn't look okay, put the CPAP, titrate your atrophy and balance or afterload reduction. Make sure that he doesn't have a hemodynamic instability, but if he goes down further in the next one or two hours, immediately intubate. They can manifest sometimes acutely as a desaturation, which we just discussed, could be because of diminished respiratory effort, because they are still not out of anesthesia due to pulmonary artery hypertension, which I just mentioned, the reactive component, even though you've controlled the increased blood flow component, the reactive component is still there. Improves with non-invasive ventilation, great, but if early signs of low cardiac output are coming in in the form of worsening lactate, decreased mixed venous, please intubate. So here is one situation where mixed venous will give you a got of ideas, okay? And echo analysis before extubation will definitely make you wiser. So always remember early extubation has to be preceded by echo. Try it a few times. A lot of cardiologists and uh, cardiac surgeons and anesthesiologists will bypass that, but believe me, they will end up biting their own needles later. Now, when we talk about this PA band with increased reactivity with pH, it is another substrate where you may require a short duration of pulmonary vasodilators to tide over the acute crisis. Now, it's very funny, right? Once where you have decreased the PBF and then you're talking of pulmonary vasodilators. But what we should remember that there is an element of vascular disease which may have set in. There may be an element of reactive vascular disease that needs to be controlled. And that is what you need, uh, that is what you're targeting. Okay. You may have to use prolonged non-invasive in such situations, minimize stimuli, in the form, control the pain, noxious stimuli has to be controlled. Don't allow the patient to jump around too much or if you are doing a section and everything, do it very cautiously with everything ready by your side. Maintain the nutrition because these patients sometimes get stuck on non-invasive for a long time. They take a long time to come out. And in case it was a tight band, avoid excessive diuresis. Don't make the patient too negative. Sometimes making the patient too negative actually adds on to the ventricular dysfunction in the form that it really collapses the ventricle and the preload component becomes an issue especially in the form of a PA band, which is sitting top of that. Okay. 
as discussed earlier, present cell hypoxia and ventricular dysfunction may require prolonged oxygen therapy and non-invasive. And in such situations, a tight PA band avoid excessive afterload reduction. And titrate inotropy decision is based entirely on the echo evaluation. Not every patient requires inotropes, but if suppose the function is bad, use inotropes to that level that you don't have tachycardia because tachycardia is something which none of these patients like. So you have to control your inotropy levels. Don't give dobutamine 15 mics, epinephrine 0.3 mics. That is not right. Don't use dopamine 10 mics. In fact, we rarely use dopamine these days. A few units still use it, but we don't use it. So keep the dopamine around 7.5 or 7.5. Don't go beyond that. If you still require supports, use a low dose ADR. Maybe use a low dose presser. Maybe that will be better. A few people use meldrodone combined with ADR, which can also be a good choice. But always remember, meldrodone sometimes can drop pressure acutely, and that is why you need guard against. Okay, just a second. Papa Doctor Lee, they're not Doctor Roy today. Ah, so because I'm in the middle of a class when but Uncle Bolo was called volume they increase cutting. Volume increase cutting and troops increase currently. Okay, huh? Because I'll be I cannot stop this intermittently, huh? I'll have to I'll come in half an hour. Okay, okay. Take it, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry. There was a call from the ICU. Okay. So you need to make sure that if you have a tight PA band. In that situation, don't give inotropes which can or inotrope dosing which is leads to tachycardia of the highest order, and avoid aggressive afterload reduction because sometimes that may work otherwise. So milrone we use it only in a desperate situation, but that also in a controlled dose, and dobutamine we don't go beyond five or seven point five, and with a touch of AP if required. A loose PA band manifests as pulmonary edema with ventricular dysfunction, may require extended ventilation. Titrate FIO2 to a saturation of 80 to 85 percent. Don't target very high saturations. And again, a balance of inotropy and afterload reduction will make a difference. So here, afterload reduction is going to help you. And use diuresis. Sometimes these cases also require aminophilin more as a diuretic rather than as a respiratory stimulant. Okay, so they benefit from aminophilin, especially if it's a loose PA band in a small child or in a preterm SGA child. Nutrition, extremely important because sometimes they're chronically or non-invasive. Asepsis, because sepsis of any form can deteriorate these patients. Electrolyte arrangements, guard against them because that can precipitate arrhythmias. And pain relief, because that is sometimes the pain and irritability that is actually precipitating the entire problem later. And when to come to the next thing, which is your bi-directional venation, you know it is a SPG to PA and estimosis. Pulsatile or non-pulsatile, mostly when the type of cases that we are talking about where you have problems, ultimately it has to be made a non-pulsatile because they are mostly cases with borderline selection with a slightly higher PA pressure and the pulsatility only adds to a obstruction or a resistance to the glen flow, venous flow. So ultimately the surgeon has to tie the pulmonary artery all together. But pulsatile again, we know its advantages in carefully selected cases. It's always better than a non-pulsatile. But in the type of cases where you have problems, ultimately it becomes a non-pulsatile only. And atrial septectomy, especially if restrictive atrial communication, associated with an AV valve repair in a few cases. Now, if a patient comes with a bidirectional again and desaturates, there can be two components to be. Either it could be a cardiac component or there could be a pulmonary component. The cardiac component would be because of the restrictive atrial communication, which if not addressed or missed, can lead to problems. A decompressing vein into systemic circulation, pulmonary venous admixture, for example, in a TAPVC with heterotaxis syndromes, where the veins are being drained separately, and a few veins have been mobilized, but a few veins have not been mobilized, and they're still draining on the wrong side. Systemic pulmonary collaterals, AV valve regurgitation, these are the situations which can precipitate desaturation in the BDG, either on ventilator or off ventilator. The pulmonary component could be a parenchymal lung disease, which should be adding on to the PVR and adding on to your problems. Increased pulmonary vascular resistance because it was a borderline selection, and the patient is having a slightly higher PVR, which is leading to a resistance to the glen flow. Small pulmonary arteries, thrombosis at the anastomosis site, Pulmonary AV fistulae, diaphragm palsy. Pulmonary AV fistulae especially becomes a specific thing if you remember the Kawashima procedure where you have a dual drainage. For example, 
you have a situation where the IVC is draining partly into the SVC through the azygous, but the hepatic veins are draining separately into the right atrium. So in these situations, what happens that your lungs do not receive the so-called hepatic factor and they develop a lot of pulmonary AV fistula and the patient gets totally desaturated. And the LGBT have to go for a Fontan, where you, uh, uh, Fontan, normally Kawashima, you say is the final correction, but here you will still have to do a Fontan where the hepatic veins are directed to the pulmonary artery. Okay, and diaphragm palsy also plays a role out here. In fact, we've seen situations of bilateral diaphragm palsy post BDG, which can be disastrous. How does it manifest clinically? Now, you know, BDG, everybody says that we should extubate them early. Obviously, for it flows better because of the lack of positive pressure ventilation. They don't like positive pressure ventilation, and it is scientifically proven. But if the patient is having any of these risk factors that we just discussed, they can have desaturation and they can manifest as irritability, upper body swelling because of the improper gland flow, increased work of breathing, especially in an extubated child. Worsening airway pressures, especially with enhanced airway reactivity associated with increased PVR and parenchymal lung disease and decreased urine output. Objective data, hypoxia, hypercarbia with a decreased ETCO2, metabolic acidosis, elevated lactate and on echo myocardial dysfunction. Besides decreased mixed venous saturation, CVP pressure, which is SVC pressure, which is elevated. So you know in the glens, they always come with the SVC line and IVC line. So it is the SVC pressure, which is elevated and IVC pressure elevated if restrictive atrial communication. Okay, so IVC pressures will be elevated if restrictive atrial communication. In this situations, instead of the SVC, it's to the IVC pressure. So always remember that you're recording the pressures correctly. A 2D echo with color Doppler will reveal myocardial dysfunction in the quantum of the AV valve leak. You can do a fluoroscopy to see the diaphragms and a CT angiography may be required to assess the aberrant decompressing channel associated with TAPVC in conjunction with heterotaxis syndromes, pulmonary AV fistula and systemic to pulmonary collaterals. Whereas aberrant IVC drainage in Kawashima where I've just discussed hepatic veins draining separately into the RA and not mobilized at that point of time at time of Kawashima, which is basically uh, then in where the IVC drains into azygous and then into the SVC. So that can be well confirmed. The hepatic vein drainage can be confirmed with the CT and Joe also later. Very important that you identify the cause with a stepwise approach. Here, there's no point of rushing into things. Understanding this cardiac pulmonary segregation is extremely important. So I think it's probable that you need to look at all these things one by one and rule them out. That will give you the diagnosis 100%. Okay, and then obviously these are the investigations we just discussed. You need to be aware of the preoperative data and the surgical procedure details because that will give you a fair clue as to how to go about it. So, example, if it is a non-pulse, it's a pulse tight vein, and the patient is not flowing very well, one procedure which can be done is tightening the pulmonary artery altogether, or tying the disconnecting the pulmonary artery from the pulmonary circulation. That may help in a certain situation, bail out. Okay, at the cost, so at the loss of pulse vitality, obviously. Early extubation, good, excellent, scientifically proven, but believe me, if the gland is myocardial dysfunction. Then coming very late in the night, then coming with a complex CHD with a major repair besides gland like TAPVC, AV valve, everything. Give them time. Don't excavate them early because not every gland fits into this. So individualize the approach. Remember that it's a patient. It's not an experiment. And if you have excavate a gland or a single ventricle patient at the wrong time, the disaster is going to be humongous. So this all of us need to understand. I'm not talking that straight forward organs, obviously, even if you can on table, you can come and extubate them after one or two hours in the ICU. But we're talking about the complex cleanse where you're done with a TAPVC repair, you've done a AV valve repair, and you may have done a PA plasty. Please go slow. Please go slow. Give them 10, 24 hours. You'll get your answers. Extubate them safely after that. Management strategies evolve around afterload reduction with the idea of improving myocardial function, prolonged non-invasive ventilation, especially if the patient came extubated, optimize diuresis, but balance it out. Don't give too much, don't give too less. Pulmonary vasodilators, where you have a background that it was a borderline PA pressure scenario and you did a glen. Anticoagulation, obviously you give an aspirin to these patients and later on you add an aspirin. Some very few patients have supposed to develop a thrombosis of the SVC or something like that. You may even have to use warfarin for short duration. Optimize nutrition, correct hypoalbuminemia, and diaphragm plication if diaphragms are a problem. After the reduction can be continued with ACE inhibitors later. BDG, the one scenario which we talked, the TAPVC, the AV valve repair, 
all these can precipitate with or present with myocardial dysfunction with hypertension and oliguria. Worst thing, metabolic acidosis, decreased mixed venous, documented with a 2D echo and color Doppler. In such patients, always rule out the arrhythmias, junctional rhythm, and CHP. Because if there is no atrial kick, these patients behave very bad. You have to give them an appropriate balance of crystalloid and colloid based on the filling pressure, especially the SVC. A balance of after reduction, ionotropy, and process. So, dopamine epinephrine combination, few centers will be comfortable with that. Mildrudon epinephrine, low dose vasopressin, a few centers will be comfortable. So, there's no hard and fast for the tube to give dopamine or mildrudon, but use something which you're comfortable with. Don't use very high doses, use a balance of doses so that you don't get tachycardia because of these agents. And know when to stop them as well. Avoid high dose of catechol means as tachycardia is universally harmful. So the patient is third phase, which can happen in this scenario. Normalize albumin levels and induce uh, albumin induced diuresis. Keep the hematocrit in the range. If the patient had a crit of 60, you can't have a crit of 30. You have to keep a crit of around 40, 45. That is what I'm saying. Keep the hematocrit in range. PD, if suppose there's too much of third spacing in the lower part, and high index of suspicion of sepsis and such situation is important, and treat them earlier. Okay, don't delay them. When you plan to extubate these cases, follow the extubation criteria, which we just discussed stringently. So hemodynamic stable, extensible gas exchange, minimum no third spacing, good urine output, extensible negative balance, all of those things have to be managed. And it preferably extubate of non-invasive. When you have a ventricular dysfunction, there's no harm in giving non-invasive for 24 to 48 hours. It will always help you. And continue basal hydrotropy till you optimize oral afterload reduction. Fontan completion. We all know that Fontan, finally, when it's done, we initially for the Chuzach criteria and the current criteria for successful Fontan circulation. The cardiac component is unobstructed ventricular inflow, no AE vas stenosis or regurgitation, a reasonable ventricular function with basal end diastolic pressure less than 12, corresponding to the mean pulmonary artery pressure, unobstructed systemic outflow, no subiotic obstruction, no calculation, and no arterial hypertension. And the pulmonary component involves a non restrictive communication between the systemic veins and the pulmonary arteries unobstructed Fontan circuit, good sized pulmonary arteries without distortion at the height of repair and later during growth, a well-developed distal vascular bed, pulp, so this has to be documented with an angiography or a CT angio, pulmonary vascular resistance with estimated mean peer pressures less than 12 to 15, unobstructed pulmonary venous return, extremely important. So these are the things which are essential if you have to do a successful Fontan. But in spite of whatever, sometimes we end up doing borderline cases, and especially in our unit, sometimes we get a lot of borderline cases where we do Fontans and we face certain issues, which I'd like to discuss so that you are more wiser. So Fontan can have immediately post-operative hypertension due to acute volume shifts, because it's all venous blood, which has been going from now to the pulmonary, and the body has its own challenges. Arrhythmias, atrial and junctional rhythms can be disastrous, so keep a close watch for them. You've done a borderline selection with high PA pressure, desaturation, be prepared for it. Major third spacing with ascites and pleural collection, low cardiac output state, Fontan circuit thrombosis, and an additional sepsis. So due to high Fontan circuit pressure, secondary to a borderline, can be because of the borderline high PA pressure, pulmonary AV fistula, or undiagnosed systemic aortic pulmonary collaterals. Each of these situations can have high Fontan circuit pressure, with, and they have to be left fenestrated sometimes in the operation theater and the fenestration shunts start to lift, so they'll be desaturated. So if the saturation is less, but you know there is a desaturation for a reason, you will have to accept that. Okay. If suppose you've not fenestrated and if it is due to high PA pressure that the patient is desaturating, a timely fenestration of the Fontan circuit or a SVC to a RA conduit, all these things can help you out. Okay. Pulmonary vasodilators balanced with after reduction and diuresis is the key. So once the patient is stabilizing, get off his oral things, continue the afterward reduction for a longer duration, and also make sure that he gets his pulmonary vasodilators and a balanced dialysis. So volume crystalloids and colloids are the mainstay to sustain hemodynamics. The crystalloids, obviously, you all know. Colloids could be in a bigger patient. It could be a starch, but we don't use starches very often because of their tendency to bleed but we still avoid it, especially even in bigger children. You can use a 5% albumin, you can use a plasma light, they can help you as, but plasma light, just not a colloid, plasma light is crystalloid. Using FFP may work in the immediate post-operative one or two days, but not afterwards. 
Okay, a lot of people use FFP or protein supplementation, but believe me, it doesn't work that way. Your FFP or protein supplementation is less, so you have to, better if you have to use that testing, use a 20% or a 5% albumin, maybe you'll be better off because the cost in a private hospital remains the same. Avoid high dose catecholamines in such situations as they can prescribe tachycardias. Fontans don't like tachycardia. Sometimes they shift it to the ICU only with basic supports and we maintain with basic support. Basic in the sense just 5 or 2.5 of dovitamin, not even more than that. And sometimes they shift it at KVO. And if patient is too sensitive to the inotropy or ino, uh, the pressure, we always make sure that we don't overdo it. But certainly, in spite of volume optimization, the hemodynamics are not stable, consider pressures. In that situation, you will need to optimize a little bit of dobitamin with viso, with norepi, to ensure that the patient's hemodynamics are well, and you don't give unusual amount of high volume. So you have to monitor your CVP and SVC. And see the, you can always see your filling status on the ECHO studies. Okay. So after load reduction may be built up gradually later based on the hemodynamic status. Milrinone, dobitamin, 7.5 max. Optimize the electrolytes so that you don't have arrhythmias. Target normal albumin levels and hematocrit. Again, hematocrit based on the pre-op hemoglobin, please remember. And diuresis guarded and only once there's a decrease in volume requirement over a period of 12, hour, 12 hours roughly. So don't rush into diuresis if the patient is draining away significantly. Don't enter into a rash episode of diuresis. Because do you give too much diuresis, the patient becomes intravascularly depleted, again, the whole thing starts, tachycardia, hypertension, and whatnot. So balance out of diuresis based on the patient's behavior. Every patient is different. You can't have a fixed dosage guideline in your mind. Based on the patient's drainage, based on the patient's urine output, try to your diuresis. A very pertinent problem in the post-operative, front dance do get exhibited early, but remain in the ICU for a long time, sometimes for the pleural drainage, which can be serous or chylus, reflective of the high venous pressure and increased lymphatic pressure, primarily observed in cases with borderline hyperimmunary artery pressure, and exacerbated in cases with non-sinus rhythm and myocardial dysfunction. A sudden increase in drainage warrants investigation to rule out thrombosis in the front dance circuit, or along with that, sepsis with capillary leak syndrome. So, Remember, sepsis and thrombosis can lead to a sudden increase in drainage. You do a plural fluid routine micro with specific triglyceride levels. You know that if the triglyceride are between 50 to 110, your chances of triglyceride are high, of, uh, sorry, chylus drainage is high. And if it's beyond 110, it's proven that it's chylus. Plural fluid culture, especially if the tubes have been there for a long time, it's advisable to sin. And sudden, if especially if your tube has been long time, change the character, it looks more like yellowish thick fluid, and your character has changed, the volume has increased, please send a fluid for routine macro and culture. It can be a source of focus, a long tube. Though at our place, we change the bags and everything every four days, but still, it can, these things, any device for that matter, can introduce an infection. Serum albumin levels, CBC, LFT, RFT, serum electrolytes, along with the PTINR, basic monitoring, has to be done periodically in a sicker patient. And sepsis markers. Fluid strategy is 6 to 60 ml per kg per day with a balance of crystalloid colloids. Again, FFP in the initial stages, but later 5 or 20% albumin and target albumin induced diuresis, slow diuresis. And if suppose there is a question of increased secretions, you can go up on injection somatostatin, which is one that decreases lymphatic drainage at 10 microgram per kg per dose, 8 hourly for 3 to 5 days. Maintain the hematocrit based on the pre-op hemoglobin, as we discussed earlier. And if myocardial dysfunction, dobitamin, oblique mildurone with ice inhibitors would bail you out in 90% situation. Some patients may require pressors, which we have already discussed. And at any given cost, avoid tachycardia. No single ventricle physiology liquid likes tachycardia. The, the furosemide, the furosemide bolus and infusion now makes don't go blindly. Start an infusion, assess the response, then titrate it. But avoid exceeding a total of 6 mg per kg per day of plastics. Now, I know your textbook says 12 mg per kg per day of plastics, but believe me, fontans with drainage don't require that much plastics. Drainage is also a loss. So remember that. Metalazone, in a few situations where you find the elastic responsiveness poor and your renal profile is normal, think metalazone, but keep a check on your sodium and potassium when you're thinking of metalazone. In case you have a sodium issue, where sodium is on the higher side, use thiazides. Potassium sparing diuretics can be used, obviously, based on the potassium levels. But if you're giving NVAS, don't give very high dose of potassium sparing diuretics because both of them lead to an increase in potassium. Nutrition, extremely important in those with drainage, calorie dense, high protein, medium chain, triglyceride based diet, 
100 to 120 kilocalories per kg per day, 2 to 3 grams per kg per day. Most of you would be aware of this. Strict input-output charting, optimize vitamin and micronutrient supplementation to ensure the dietary compliance, monitor serumalbumin, hematocrit, RFT, LFT, PTNR, and electrolytes at least twice a week in those with prolonged drainage. Okay. Tachy arrhythmias in a fontan, always detrimental. If junctional rhythm, not a very fast rate, we can do overdrive atrial pacing, consider beta blockers, especially if the hemodynamics are stable. But if there's a tachyarrhythmia or atrial tachy with a hemodynamic instability, consider synchronized cardioversion with antiarrhythmics. Atrial tachyarrhythmia sometimes may respond to vagal stimuli, rapid atrial pacing, transient bailouts, but not always. They will require the long term anti uh, arrhythmic drug later, like a quadron. And sometimes they respond to beta blockers better, so keep options open. But in an acute phase, use cordron and then build it over to a beta log or transit to a beta log once you're shifting to oral. While giving cordron, maintain the cordron level charting so that you don't know that you're not overdoing that. And maintain the electrolyte homeostasis and magnesium supplemented as a membrane stabilizer. Potassium should be kept around 3.5 to 4 and magnesium around 1.6 to 2.8. In patients with tachyarrhythmia, don't give too much lasix to circumvent electrolyte shifts. Tritrate volume based on the filling pressures and avoid being too negative. Target normal albumin and hematocrit again based on the hypnotic status. This is extremely important in these single reticles. And optimize anticoagulation. So you keep an INR of around 2.5 to 3. Fontan circuit thrombosis can manifest as a sudden increase in drainage, desaturation, hemodynamic instability, ascites, and limb edema. And the diagnosis and management is obviously, I'm sorry, on CT and MRI aging, besides your echo, which will give us a clue, but CT or MRI aging will be the final diagnosis, especially if diagnosed or suspected in 2D echo with color Doppler. Always you need to know your coagulation profile because you have to give strong anticoagulants out here. Can respond to heparin at 7 to 10 units per kg. Okay. But today, probably what happened was that everybody was too busy. So if you have a situation where you are giving heparin, make sure that you are ensuring that you're monitoring the ACTs, okay, in the initial stages. And once you reach around 200, make sure that you don't overdo the heparin again, because you don't want the side effects of heparin coming in, like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, especially in long-term usage. If there's no improvement in 24 hours, consider streptokinase and TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. Sometimes in a drastic situation, you may even have to go for a surgical evacuation of the thrombus. But if you can manage it early, diagnose it early, maybe you can prevent that surgical thing altogether. So don't be very aggressive in the management of a thrombus when it happens. We all give anticoagulation targeting an INR of 2.5 to 3 in Fontans. But sometimes in spite of all our efforts, especially in the borderline cases where there is a little bit of a high pressure Fontan circuit because of the high PA pressures, you can have thrombosis come what may in spite of your anticoagulation. So remember that in the patient who deteriorates suddenly, this diagnosis should be at the back of your head. So I think that was from my side regarding the problems in a single ventricle physiology palliations. Okay, it's a very vast topic to be covered in one hour, but I've tried to incorporate most of the issues. But if still any one of you feels that we need to discuss something, you can take my email address, you can communicate with me, and we can discuss it out. Meanwhile, if anybody has questions, please start on.